Welcome everyone. Pleasant good evening, pleasant good afternoon, pleasant good night, pleasant good morning from wherever you are. And I wanna say welcome. My name is Andrew B. Campbell, AKA Dr. ABC. And it is my pleasure to be your moderator for this year for the Boise the Black Faculty in Conversation 2022. We wanna say a special welcome to our Dean and also wish to stop and recognize the Office of the Dean for the support for the, for the Center for Black Studies in Education has received. We wanna also say a very special welcome to the Organization Committee, um, the Equity C Council of OISE. I also wanna again say a special welcome to faculty, staff, students, and a very special welcome, yes, there is that word again, special to community. Thank you so much, community, we see you. In 2020, we gather to discuss critical issues that affect Black communities at the University of Toronto in the GTA and beyond. In 2021, we gathered again in conversation with our communities about our collective futures in COVID times. Now in 2022, we turn our focus once again in conversation as we talk about the new Center for Black Studies in Education. This is a third installment, and I am excited to be on this journey once again with you. I want to stop at this time and acknowledge one of our professors who is not with us, who I'm sure is missing us and want to be with us, and that is Professor Anne Lopez, who is on sabbatical, and I'm sure she's missing us, and I hope she's listening from afar, from wherever she's at. We also have in conversation this evening, the newly appointed founding director for the Center for Black Studies in Education, Dr. Amal Madibo. And you'll be hearing from her um, as a part of the panel this evening. We also have two members of the OISE faculty, two new members, sorry, of the OISE faculty joining this conversation. And those persons are Professor Whitney Gard Walker and also Professor Linda Iwenofu. We are growing and we are changing and we are just growing into this process. But we also want to honor and respect and to just bring into the room the power of the professors who have always been with us in the conversation. And those are professors Lance McCready, Professor Roslyn Ampton, Professor Jokey Wayne, and Professor George Nana Lope, George Day. So I'm gonna ask everybody to pull up a chair, sit back, mm -hmm. lean in, and just have conversation. At this time, we will invite uh, um, Tanaka to do the land acknowledgement and immediately followed after Tanaka will be the pouring of libation. And you're gonna realize this evening that the pouring of libation is coming to us all the way from Ghana. I'm excited, I am excited, I am excited. Taneka, over to you. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn on this land. Oh, Professor 
Adrofans Fade, all Cobbridge, all Cobbin and Namadama. Most one of the Entamasu, number Napa, number Napa. I did a big Musonia Sabia, Namadama, open my Majin Salem, on the Eric, and any ma, the Busia, so no Cobbin, and Namadama, who are called Cook of Fulia Cabo Gudu. Now, so it's answer. Oh, my wife in fact, and another smooth sort of munti, put me in the court, not the number, Namada, Mamma Bonibia and Cano, on the Eric, who soon has sent the Bacumiano, and I'm on Pebu. And I'm a hanging answer so, Tanya said that was young, and I'm a year quiet by you put him crap, one of them who won, only Sika Fibre, a Piesica will be an Anamadaroma, and that's the father in Satuma, in Esica, eh, why you so my Nesica, Namadaroma, who Cressica, we need you, a Sian Gotia Druma, and one year high, Namadaroma, where she don't wear. Here, Cassa Lugum, Mana Gudru, Mani Yansa, Mani Tumi, or Cassama Funti, Ontri Dom, and Amadar Mamadin Seno. Here, can I say, you are not for me so brutally? I am Nana, and I know more quite number, and for me saying Joki, Unquaso, Unquaso, and Joki Unquaso, Aman Quaso, Aman Quaso, Aman Quaso, Rosalie Quaso, Nimquaso, Nimquaso. Linda and Quasso, Nimquasso, Nimquasso, Lance and Quasso, Nimquasso, Nimquasso, and Andrew and Quasso, Nimquasso, Nimquasso, and Amadaroma Nana Day, Nimquasso, 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 Tequila, Honors and Quasso, Nimquasso, Nipa Bomudin, and Amadaroma, don't get the any ye, no more brapa, Naman Samahe, ye for her one, ye for her up with himself. And yet, they so they didn't even Muyanka, Muyank, my mother, and no matter where you find to find, and I won't come home. Let the only be any ye, a shum Cosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosacosac
2019. And in that meeting, we had Renando, who is uh, with the new college, Lance and Lopez, George Day, Wanja, and myself, and then the dean. You can, I mean, we were that small group and uh, we had uh, requested we meet with the dean. And the idea was just to use one word, commitment. Commitment to making black scholarship more visible. And of course he asked, how, how would that be expected to be shown because you're already doing research, you're already publishing. And we said, number one, we needed resources, we needed space, we needed more faculty, we needed more, more students. And, um, and based on that conversation, we also indicated that we wanted intentional, intentional commitment in terms of hiring of black faculty, intentional establishment of the scholarships for black students. And then, and, and then we, the Dean, I remember responded by saying, why don't we start meeting every month so that we can come up with the tangible plan on how to go ahead. So in the second meeting, we said we needed initial funds to do our environmental scan. And also we needed, uh, we needed information to start having a strategic plan in time because we couldn't just go ahead and say, we want more faculty in all the departments. We want more students in all the, the departments. We had to have a strategic plan, which actually came into free t-shirt. And in addition to that, we said, in terms of space, not just an office, we wanted a space that we'll call a center for black studies. So what that meant is we needed to have information, we needed to have knowledge in order for us to have evidence that there was need for us. So we were given initial uh, uh, funding for one of our graduate students to go out and find out who was teaching anything to do with black studies, who was doing research in black studies, and we felt that it was all scattered you know, within OIC and there wasn't a coherent way of actually knowing what, who was doing what. And based on that information, we went ahead and start, started working on a proposal to propose a Black Studies Center. It took long, you, you remember we started 2019 and uh, we sent out, um, you know, we, we got Everton to, to do all the work, to send out word, to different faculties of U of T to check if there is any other uh, group of faculty doing the similar work that we wanted to establish. And when there was clear evidence that there was nothing like what we were proposing, we presented the, um, our proposal to the, you know, to the Dean, Associate Dean, uh, Michelle uh, Patterson Pendali, and uh, through how we worked through to ensure that we had all the, T's and D's and everything uh, were mapped out. And uh, I'll tell you, so at that time, Dr. Lopez and myself, we were co-directors because we needed at least the two people, two faculty to guide the process. And last year in December, the center was passed unanimously. And uh, from there on, of course, uh, we started uh, looking for a new director and that is uh, Madipo. Let me just tell you, since 2019, January 2019, we have increased the faculty, the black faculty. We have, uh, we have seed funding for the, for, the, for the center. And I just want to say thank you to Glenn Jones, who was the, the, the dean who started these conversations with us. And thank you to the current dean, uh, Norma Labrie, who has agreed to see us through this, as well as thank you to Helen, our CAO, for holding on with us as we establish the, 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 the Black Studies Center. Thank you again uh, for this wonderful, wonderful uh, opportunity to provide that, because I think we are growing. We are growing. We started how many? One, two, three, four, five, six of us, and now, we are more than 10. We are growing. We are growing. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Professor Joke, for that. Thank you so much for that, for giving us context to the Center for Black Studies, the power of leadership, the power of advocacy, the power of heart and the power of work. And I want to thank you for that. And I, and, and I love that you acknowledge everyone. And for those persons, I just want you to know that how much we appreciate the work you do in bridge building, the work you do in heart building, the work you do in community building and growth. So thank you for that. We're going to go right into our conversation at this time because I know everybody's waiting to listen, waiting to hear all the great stuff that's happening and what people are sharing and how you can become a part of the work as well. So this first round, we're going to have all our panelists and they'll come in in, in order. All our panelists will have five minutes. And in that five, first five minutes, we're going to speak about the significance of the new Center for Black Studies and how the work they are involved in would contribute to the center's mandate. All, all these professors are already engaged in amazing work, but now we're going to merge that amazing work with the mandate, with the mandate for the center for the center for Black Studies in Education. We're going to start now. Um, George will follow by Professor George and Rosalind, Professor Lance, Professor Jokey, Whitney, Linda, Linda, and our new director will close off this first section from Professor Amal. So go ahead, over to you, Professor George. Yeah, um, just um, greetings to everyone again, and uh, also appreciate the elders coming to join us uh, in the conversation. Also, happy Black History. Um, I think this is time for us to, to think through um, and basically um, take care of each other in these default times. I, I also want to just paraphrase my remarks in memory of uh, one of all these um, great faculty members, Edmund Sullivan, who passed away. Uh, a few days ago. So this is in memory, my comments are in memory of, of Edmund. Um, I also want to acknowledge my colleagues uh, who are on this panel uh, with me. Um, I, I think one of the things we all talk about is look, when we have safe spaces, how they become very aspirational in terms of what we want to do. Uh, but it also means that we become aware of some of the historical and contemporary uh, challenges that we, we, we see in, in, in the lives of as a scholars, um, and I'm here talking about challenges which have to do with coloniality defined broadly, right? Um, no, I've been in Ghana for about a couple of months now, and I've, I've been reading about, for example, the, the bomb threats that the historically black um, university and colleges in the US uh, are dealing with at the moment. Um, and then also we see what's, when we look at the Ghana, Ghanaian news, there's this heavy coverage of the so-called um, uh, the, the the convoy, the, those people who are claiming that they are defending their right, the freedom convoy, and 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 what is very interesting uh, for me is when we hear people talk about freedom and rights, right? And and then when the police is asked to step in, the first person they actually arrest happens to be an indigenous man who was actually a counter protester. protester. Uh, this to me tells me a lot about what we're dealing with in that, and there are so many instances that we. We can we can point to. Um, in, in terms of the question, I want to make this point, right? That look, a black study center is a celebration of black excellence. We know it, we know it. But I think to me, I want it to be more than that. I, I want it to be a burden of a new black intellectual praxis uh, in these educational spaces. So how do I see this uh, what I, this new black intellectual praxis? And I just want to highlight five points briefly. One is having an expansive intellectual agenda, an expansive black intellectual agenda. Uh, I will caution that while this doesn't mean that, oh, it's about race and blackness, I also want to emphasize that it has everything to do with race and blackness. But it's more than that in terms of the complexities of our lives, it's also in terms of the politics and the histories and that. So that's the first point. The second that is also the issue about why it's important for us to connect the black scholar or the black learner with black scholarship. The two are not always the same, but it's very, very important for us. And I think to me, I see the significance of how we're able to make that connection between the black scholar uh, and, and, and black scholarship in, 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 in this regard. And what, by that, what I mean is, for example, we have certain responsibilities as black scholars, which goes beyond simply our scholarship. One is the mention of our students. There's also the responsibility, which is our obligations to our, our various communities. Uh, so that we don't advance our careers, our scholarship, 
on their backs or stealing our communities from a distance, as many people have, have said. And this is why, to me, the, the conjoining of Black studies and Black scholarship become very, very important. Uh, thirdly, in joking, her remarks uh, talked about uh, the question of the Black Studies Center. It's a combination of a long history. But this is our story. The story of Black existence, our achievements, and our successes is not just long, but it also talks about struggles. And this is why history is very, very important here. And I think here, as Adlaber recently said, right, history makes certain demands on the past, the present, and the future. And one of said demands to me is how we maintain that institutional critique. We need to maintain that institutional critique, which goes beyond the politics of refusal, as uh, many indigenous scholars like Iftak and others talk about, uh, San Grant, right? I'm talking here about what myself and uh, Mary Carmen, we talk about in terms of the speciality of reparations and what it means for our scholarship. So when we have these spaces, we have to hold our institutions accountable, hold them to defeat. Just because we have this center doesn't mean the work is done because it's this institution that we produce the anti-blackness that some of us have to deal with. So we hold them to defeat that the work is not done. The fourth is also to see this as a way to challenge what I would call the colonial code. And the colonial code is not just simply things which have to do with uh, uh, um, our invisibility, our silences, or negations or omissions. To me, it more powerfully speaks to the question of how we seek a resolution to our grievances on our own terms. That's very, very important. We seek it on own terms, not terms defined by somebody else. And I think this is why it's so important that this center becomes a space where we navigate our grievances on our own terms. And in that process, we center questions of African spirituality, the healing, the connections, the community building, that's very, very important. And lastly, uh, I think to me, this is very, very important too, that as we have this space, right? Let us remember that Oji cannot, and it should not take a back seat to anyone, to any institution, any faculty in the study of Black studies and education. Because we have a long history, we have a long intellectual tradition around that, that needs to be nurtured, that needs to be grown. And we are not going to take a back seat to anyone. And I think to me, this is very, very important. So I'm just going to stop here on that. Thank you, Rosalind. Professor Rosalind, over to you. Thank you, Dr. ABC. Um, and thank you to Tinika for the wonderful um, opening of the land acknowledgement to Professor Day um, and the elders in Ghana and to Dr. Wan for setting up the context um, through which this incredible Center for Black Studies and Education is coming into being. Um, I'm really um, kind of excited about this uh, presentation. I feel like um, it's really become a wonderful annual tradition and, and folks refer to us uh, about it um, leading up to the event, but then also after the event, I've met people who've, who've watched these recordings. So I'm really grateful to be here and grateful um, to everybody who's joined us to watch. Um, so yes, my name is Rosalind Hampton. Um, I work in the Department of Social Justice uh, Education at OISE. And um, thinking about the center in a lot of ways in relation to my work, um, like many other Black and Indigenous um, and other people who grow up in poor and working class communities, for me, university was not um, an obvious uh, or even anticipated goal. Um, and I worked like many years pursue, uh, before and after pursuing an undergraduate degree. Um, and I feel like this indirect pathway um, to academia really informs how I take up my role as, as a professor of Black Studies. Um, and as an entry point that um, allows me to kind of remain tethered to really strong concerns about um, access to meaningful engagements in post-secondary education um, for Black students, and also the relationships between universities um, and the local communities uh, within which and adjacent to which they're situated. Um, so this entry point, I think, is a really uh, strong advantage for, for Black studies, and um, it's how I kind of think about um, the work that I do, but also how many of the students I encounter have also come to the academy, um, and I want for us to be able to hold space um, for those students as well as we think about uh, the center. Um, I think that 
Black Studies and a Center for Black Studies and Education can provide us with um, a really critical scholarly site and tradition to identify with. Um, and in the name and tradition of Black Studies, I find um, space for pedagogical and research practices that very much like what Professor Day was saying, um, really prioritize relationship building, community building, collaboration, and explicitly work um, to undermine uh, colonialism and capitalism and the ways in which um, their logics have, have um, kind of been the foundation of the academy till now. So I think it's really important that we do work that explicitly works to undermine the competitive individualism, elitism, hierarchy, and authoritarianism that are really so often normalized within um, academia. So in terms of the tremendous potentials for the, the center as, as you know, scholars of black studies, we're aware of course, and that in addition to um, the incredible persistent work of senior black scholars at OISE, of course, uh, as Dr. Wan has described, um, the openings of institutional space for black studies um, are also happening within the broader context of racial neoliberalism um, and a period of reform in the academy. Um, the institution will benefit tremendously uh, from the work of the black scholars it hires, um, the black students that are recruited and indeed the various initiatives uh, for black studies that are created. And this is in part the institution um, restabilizing its authority in the, in the wake of, of black and indigenous activism and persistence as well as shifting social, political and economic discourses. So I think what I'm most excited about um, in terms of the potential of the center and again, very much similar to what Dr. Day has said, um, it really can be a hub for fostering the conditions and providing the resources that will support students and scholars of black studies in pursuing work that's specifically geared towards social and economic justice, including within the parameters of the actual university itself. And I see profound potential for the work of the center and those affiliated with it to influence the directions of Black studies um, as it's coming into the university in the Canadian context. So to push beyond the current and very telling institutional hyper-focus right now on anti-Black racism and to be a leader in moving us towards a deep and rigorous ongoing engagement with um, the body of scholarship that's variously oriented towards, towards Black liberation. So um, I have some more specific ideas, but I think I'm gonna leave them for um, the next round right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Roslyn. I could listen to you all day, literally, and I mean that. Um, I love um, this conversation about moving, not moving beyond, but extending the conversation to, to so many other areas of how, you know, for economic and social justice and just extending the conversation beyond the one that we are so normal, we are so used to. We're going to invite right now to join in the conversation, Professor Lance McCready. Professor Lance McCready, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and so I just want to thank everyone. Um, for um, their, their life, their words, their spirit. I'm so happy to be here with my colleagues and to have one time at least during the year when we can be in conversation and um, share ideas and appreciate each other's work um, and really begin to build this new space um, within uh, OISE, the Center for Black Studies in Education. I think, uh, I, I just want to say that I'm an associate professor in the leadership higher and adult education department, and I'm affiliated with the adult education and community development program. And I'm also the director of the transitional year program, which was originally established over 50 years ago to provide more pathways for black and indigenous students to undergraduate study at the University of Toronto. So it's an access program and I'm very proud to be a part of that tradition um, and to uh, now serve as director of that program. I've been director of the program for four years. I think for me, I. I guess I'll speak sort of more specifically about how 
I want the Center for Black Studies and Education to really engage um, in this larger project of Black community development. And for me, Black community development is really a process where Black community members come together to take action and generate solutions around issues and problems that are faking, facing Black communities diasporically. So I should, I could also say sort of African Caribbean Black communities sort of both locally um, and globally. And uh, the way I focus that work and what I want to extend to the Center for Black Studies and Education um, is through my Making Spaces Lab. The Making Spaces Lab um, promotes Black community development through research, program adaptation, curriculum and training that's creative, decolonizing, restorative, evidence-based, and transformative. It's very much comes out of my own lived experiences as a Black, gay, centered, same gender loving man growing up in New York City. My academic study, first as an undergraduate in English, history, psychology, and African American studies, which I think is important for people to know that sort of Black studies um, has always been and will always be um, a very much an interdisciplinary <laughs> sort of area of work. All of us that sort of come to sort of Black studies have, have often come to it not through one channel or one discipline. It's been the combined ideas and experiences for me in English, in history, in AFAM studies, and in psychology. But later also, I began to focus my work um, in sociology, anthropology, women, and gender studies. And these are all the sort of areas of academic study that have influenced my work in the Making Spaces Lab, as well as my work uh, in my practice as a youth worker, as a dancer, as a facilitator, and as a researcher. Right, so there are some of the sort of key areas that um, the, the Making Spaces Lab focuses on are Black youth studies, Black, gay, bi, same gender loving health and well being, and Black families, gender relations, and gender based violence in families, Black families. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention that I have so much been inspired by the work of a uh, sociologist that is not necessarily as recognized within the Canadian canon of sociology, but should be. And I just wrote a chapter of why, but I'm, and I'm talking about W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the first sociologists to see the purpose of illustrating structural racism through combining research with census data to create visual illustrations and findings in bar graphs of all things. Through this combination of methods, Du Bois was able to illustrate the realities of racism, how it impacted the lives and opportunities of African American communities, and provide much needed evidence in the fight to disprove the supposed cultural and intellectual inferiority of Black people. This desire to unearth data as a reflection of social conditions, attitudes, and values was an early feature of the kind of public sociology that Du Bois used to refute the popular racial myths and misinformation. Du Bois use of public sociology to address the marginalization of Black people sets them apart from other sociology peers. Du Bois predated the mythical Chicago School of Sociology. His research was rigorous in its mapping of African-American urban and rural life, refuting the racist assumptions of the time. So I want us to sort of understand the work of the Center for Black Studies and Education as having a long history, as being deeply embedded in academic study, not something that sort of students have to think of as something off to the side. And for me, always my Black Studies programs, my African-American Studies programs in the United States really became the space where I could culture, cultivate that sort of um, awareness, that sort of consciousness, um, and grow with other sort of Black students and non-Black students who are committed to this larger goal of Black community development. So I invite you to be a part of the Center for Black Studies in Education um, to really promote and develop Black um, community development here in Canada. Thank you so much, 
Professor Lance McCready. And I, as we say back home in Jamaica, you're not only talk the talk, but you walk the talk. I just, I, I'm listening to you. And when you talk about making space, I smile because I remembered myself in Oise as a young, young girl, I always say young girl, <laughs> black student who also identifies Caribbean, identifies gay, and, and, and going into scholarship. And I remember when you invited me to present at the conference, which I didn't get to attend, the beloved conference, that was making space. I remember when I told you I was writing a, a course, a developing a course, and you gave me everything. You said, use what you want from this. That is making space. So as a community listens, I want you to understand the power of the collegiality and making space as we do this work. Absolutely amazing. We're gonna move right along and we're gonna invite Joke to come right into the conversation. Joke, as you also share with us in the same conversation about the significance and the mandate and your work. Go ahead. Thank you again for the opportunity to talk about how does the work that will be done at the center speak to me, speak to the community and speak to the needs of black members, black members, black um, population and so on and so forth. You know, when I think of the black studies center, I'm thinking at a space where we'll be able to disrupt colonial logic. Where we'll be able to, to interrogate and look closely to, to, to the work that we do as, when I say we, I'm talking of the black community, the black scholars, so that the, the black scholarship that is produced. And then I, the, the, the center will be that space that will be articulating and providing information in black radical intellectual. In addition to that, it will be a space where people can walk to and say, can I look at uh, any, do you have any information that is providing us in terms of understanding black identity? Because sometimes when we talk about black identity, it's misconstrued, it's misunderstood and so on and so forth because of the hetero heterogeneity of the various identities that we have. And uh, also looking at the complexities because we do have black youth who say, I don't see myself as black. I don't see myself as African. And uh, you know, talking about that in particular when it comes to my work, I do remember when we started this conversation and Edison, who was uh, our G at that time, when she did the research, we found that whatever was being done was scattered. This space will be a, a space where we can walk in and um, you know, whoever is working there, can you provide me with this or that in terms of a particular topic? And this will mean that, for instance, when I, when I started at OISE, I looked at the gaps. There was no particular research done on Black Canadian women. And hence, that's how Black Canadian feminisms stroke African feminisms or women of African ancestry began. All that work is going to be archived at the Black Studies Center. And also when we are thinking of Black women in leadership, I am teaching a course, I'm doing research with Dr. Lopez on Black women leadership. There was nothing, nothing at all. There was one article that was talking about racialized women in Canada. That material will be archived within the Black Center. Right now, I am looking at where our Black boys, when you, when you go through the halls of Oise or the halls of the academe, you rarely see Black men. You rarely see them. You can see them spotted here and there. Where are they? So my current research, once it's done, will do the archiving of that information there. And uh, you know, th there are things that we talk about, and I'm glad um, Lance talked about African American and the notion of sociology, anthropology, literature, and so on and so forth. It's actually looking at how the center can provide the space for voices of the children, people of African ancestry. Because yes, we are very heterogeneous. We are, our cultures are very different. Our experiences are very different, but we need a space 
we need a space because the outsiders see us as black people, but we need a space where we can have conversations. We can have, you know, held the conversations, interrogating some of these conflicts, some of the tension that has been created by the colonial logic. We need to have a space where we are talking about the colonial past so that the history of people of African ancestry doesn't begin with the, with the, with the, the, the story of slavery. We do have, and right now, I'm actually doing research on that. There is so much that is not known about um, the African past that needs to be archived within that, um, you know, within that center where people can come, people can come from different um, divisions, different specializations, and uh, have a conversation there. You know, uh, Professor Day talked about African spirituality. It's, it's well known African spirituality goes way, way thousands of years. We need to bring it to the forefront. And the reason for, for, for saying all that is that, you know, unless we take effort to showcase, to showcase our intellectuals, our excellence, nobody would do it for us. And because we are constantly talking about, we need to liberate our mind. No one will liberate our mind except us. And we cannot liberate our mind without knowing where the next step is going to, to come from. And all the knowledge, the center will be that space where uh, you know, somebody can go and say, I need information on this, I need information on this. I'm stuck in my thinking because of that. So liberating our mind will not come from outsiders, it will come from us. And we have to make a concerted effort to liberate each one of our minds. And it starts from you. In other words, what I'm saying is that we have to keep, we have always operated from the margin. We have always operated from the margin. We are creating a center at the margin, a center that speaks to us so that not, not, we cannot be pushed to the margin because we are already a center in itself. And the last but not least, I'll end with this famous quote. Everybody knows about this uh, quote by Chinua Chepe, which states that until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. We have taken the tools to document, to write, to correct our histories. And those corrected histories, those stories will be found at the center. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. I'm, I'm, I'm bending down a little bit, just give me a minute, because what I'm doing is picking up the mic that you just dropped. And I see you, Dr. Whitney, I see you up there nodding right through because I am writing notes and I, I don't have enough hands to write the notes. Thank you for that. I am motivated. I've never heard somebody talk about archives in such a powerful manner before. Like I want to work on archives, but only when you said about nobody can push me to the center because the work stopped. Listen, let's, let me calm down. Let me calm down. Dr. Whitney, you better take the mic right now. Go ahead, please take the mic. You know, I, you will always see me snapping. You will always see me getting my little church rock. You will always see me participating physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, because that is what we do, right? That is what we do um, as black folks. We listen with our whole heart, our whole mind. And uh, to see another person in the audience with a nod, with a smile, with a snap, that is encouragement, right? And so thank you. Uh, thank you, Jokey. So I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Whitney Louise Garrett Walker. Um, I am wife to Dr. J. Garrett Walker. I am mama to Cadence Paz, daughter of Danette and James, granddaughter of James Garrett II, of Virginia Martin, of Barbara Huey, of Reginald Huey, 
and of Michael Verche. Um, I stand on the shoulders of my ancestors and when you see me, you see them, all right? I would also like to take this time to um, thank the Black Faculty Caucus. Uh, it was last year around the same time I hadn't even had my interview with Oise yet. And I was watching Dr. McCready, Dr. Juan. I was watching uh, Dr. Hampton, Dr. Day. And I was like, wow, what a powerful faculty. What powerful black scholars. And now I'm on the panel, somebody. <laughs> so this is beautiful. So I am um, I'm faculty in the leadership higher and adult education department specifically the Educational Leadership and Policy Program. Um, and my research centers the experiences of Black and Indigenous women school administrators and the ways in which they cultivate joy, purpose, and define those things for themselves, along with their pro the promise and their challenges that they may experience. Um, when I was thinking about what I would do during my, what I would speak about during this time, um, the first thing that popped into my mind is my favorite poem, A Litany for Survival by Audre Lorde. Um, I'd like to read uh, the last stanza, the last two stanzas. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak remembering we were never meant to survive. And so um, if you have never read that poem, if you have never heard Audre Lorde, a um, African-American woman, poet, scholar, queer person, um, and just overall, overall center in my work, uh, please do yourself a favor, go to YouTube, Google a litany for survival and put that in your back pocket. Um, when I, based on this poem and based on my identity as a Black, Indigenous, and queer woman, I really think that this center um, is going to support so many people, faculty, staff, students, um, other collaborators, community members, and our ability to reimagine, to un- unearth the Black radical imagination. All right, let me be clear. The Black radical imagination is all about remembering, right? It's about remembering who you are, whose you are, how you enter and how, and less so these colonial mindsets of how you want to be perceived and seen, right? And so the Black radical imagination is a space um, where we're able to challenge the status quo, challenge uh, coloniality, challenge uh, the ways in which we're seen in media and textbooks and leadership and teacher education, et cetera. And so um, I also see the center as a space for solidarity, um, centering love and critical hope. And so to do that, um, that's going to take a lot of work for Black folks to come together and undo, right? You know how you're working on an email and you go ahead and backspace? Well, there's so much for us to backspace. There's so much for us to release because it's no longer serving us. It is not. And so for that reason, um, I'd like to save a little bit more about what I have to say about the center in the interest of time, but thank you. Go ahead, Dr. ABC. Come on, right? I, I saw that nod. I was like, yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. And then and then you took the mic and you talk about your work in 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 cult in, in working with school leaders and black and indigenous in cultivating joy. And I was like, okay, I'm at the right place this evening. We're gonna invite another new professor. Thank you so much again, Dr. Dr. Whitney. We're gonna invite our new professor again who's with us and excited and just amazing contribution to jump right into the conversation. Dr. Linda, over to you. Please join us in conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. ABC. Thank you everyone that is on this panel and everybody that's here today. I'm just honored to be here and to be a part of this. Um, like, you know, Dr. Whitney, I was watching you guys last year and just in awe of a lot of, um, you know, my elders being here that I've admired for years. So thank you. Uh, so I'm 
Linda Wenifu, I'm a new faculty member at OAZ, assistant professor in the Department of Applied Psychology and Human Development. I'm also a clinical child um, psychologist, so I'm actually involved actively in the clinical and community-based practice of psychology. So things like assessment, treatment, broader interventions, um, as well as in the scholarly study of psychology, more specifically Black psychology. Um, and in my more recent work, I'm really interested in, um, you know, the Black experience, Black children, youth, and their families, um, and community, and in understanding, you know, the multiple ways that anti-Black racism and other social determinants of health, you know, like migration, housing, a social economic status, really impact our children's development, um, the mental health and well-being, um, and educational achievement among our, our communities and our children and youth. You know, so I, in thinking about the center um, and as a, you know, black psychologist of which there are so few of us in the field, I really want to speak to, to, the, to the, that, that field and, and that factor of bringing in psychology and the discussion around mental health um, as part of the work in the center. I really think that that's something that we can really contribute um, in an area where there's so little um, work that has been done in in Canada, especially, you know, as a faculty member in the the Department of Psych Applied Psychology and Human Development here, and being one of you know only one of two faculty in that de department that is black, um, I can tell you, you know, we have five graduate programs. Three of them are dedicated to teaching future practitioners in clinical and counseling psychology. Um, we know that there's a mental health crisis in our Black community. You know, we've talked about, and many others before me have talked about so many different issues um, that impact our community. We have higher rates of suicide among our children. Um, and our kids are among the most distressed of those who seek out crisis supports. Uh, and Black kids and youth are still the least likely to engage with mental health supports for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, and we know that schools and our education system Unfortunately, fortunately and unfortunately, is often the primary mental health provider for our kids. So having a center such as this one that can really be a hub for knowledge and community sharing amongst current and future educators, you know, school-based practitioners and educational leaders, I think is going to be really critical. Um, we ha also have very few practitioners of color, like I mentioned. Uh, and so affiliating, you know, my work in Black mental health and Black psychology, bringing that expertise around clinical developmental psychology with, and merging that with the center, I think at, at the very least will help increase visibility to some of those issues. Um, you know, and I, I, I would argue that Black psychology really is an integral aspect of Black studies. Like Dr. McCready mentioned, you know, we all come in sort of from multiple disciplines, you know, Black studies cut, cuts across the spectrum. Uh, and I don't think anyone would argue that, you know, having a center where we could further explore and understand the impact on the Black psyche of, you know, Black Canadians historical and present day experiences with anti-Black racism is something that is worthy for us to pursue so that we can work towards that liberation, right, that, that others have talked about. Um, and I also think that you know, this center would be unique um, in, in, a, in that it will be among the first academic research centers I, I, that I know of in Canada that would have sort of a mandate or a part of it dedicated primarily to studying and understanding the social, bio, biological, cultural determinants of mental health uh, for our Black communities. You know, so I really um, am excited to, to kind of come in and bring that aspect of scholarship to the center and be part of the growing number of scholars who are really looking to, to center blackness in psychological theory and practice. So really energized for this uh, and I'm grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Linda, for, for Linda, for joining us in the conversation. In, Professor Jardé shared five things with us as the beginning in his open remarks. And the one, the first of the five, he said expansive, Black intellectual agenda. And as you came into conversation, you started to talk about other issues of mental health and psychology and those things. And so it's so important to see how many spaces that we can create for voices to be engaged and resources and access as uh, Professor Joki talked about. So that is so great. The last person now join us in now in the conversation as of course is our founder 
a founding director for the Center of Black Excellence, and with Professor Amal Madibo. Professor Amal, it's over to you. Please join us in conversation. Thank you. Of course, I echo my colleagues, you know, thanking the organizers of this event, the audience, and my colleagues, the panelists, our Dean Norman Ladry, and uh, the community who shared with us the power of the ancestors uh, from Ghana. You know, although my title is the founding director, and in some ways I am, they are where they are actually, you know, founding directors who preceded me, uh, the Black Faculty Caucus and the two previous you know, interim directors, um, Njokuin and Anne Lopez, and uh, thanks to them. Right away, I'm going actually to ask you to stay tuned. This event is important, but it is just the beginning. So much is coming, including the official grand opening of the center in early fall. So again, stay tuned. So the center of course is very important for so many reasons, including the ones that my colleagues have mentioned. It is a hub and a juncture. It is a point of connections, you know, connecting scholarship, education and practice, connecting community and the university and connecting blacks in terms of connections and building, you know, continue to building, to build ties among Blacks in Canada, in Africa, the Caribbean, and the rest of the diaspora. And also connections of history, Black history, and the present in order to pave the way for the equitable future. Speaking to the question, how my work could contribute to the center's mandate, which also means that the center, as I'm sure, will also support my work as it will support our collective work. My contribution, my work contributes to the center because as is the case of the work of my colleagues, it overlaps with and strengthens the vision and strategic goals of the center. I focus on the interest section between black studies and Francophone studies a tradition that was established by the thinkers of negritude. For example, Singur in his book, Negritude, a Humanism of the 20th Century. So Singur stressed that black studies make the Francophonie more humanistic because black studies bring rich and enriching history, philosophies and anti-colonial strategies against colonialism and associated anti-Black racism and so on. So I extended this tradition of the intersection between Black studies and Francophone studies to Canada. I have been conducting research you know, with Black Francophones in a number of provinces. And you know that in Canada, Black Francophones are invisible, both within the larger Black community and within the Francophonie. And since I will continue to pursue my research agenda on Black Francophones in Canada, my work allows the center to be inclusive to and reach out to many groups of, of Blacks, in this case, the Black Francophones in matters of scholarship, you know, the intellectualism that Dr. Day spoke to, pedagogy and community engagement, among other things. I also conduct research in a few countries in Africa, including in Francophone countries, such as Senegal and Mali. There are many ties that Blacks build between you know, themselves, ourselves in Canada and the sending countries, um, in this case in Africa, you know, in order to make immigration beneficial to our sending to the sending countries as it has been beneficial to Canada. And these diasporic connections that are built within among the Blacks extend, you know, are not only confined to the Black Francophones, but also to other Blacks, such as the Sudanese, the Ethiopians, and so on. And the ties do not only target sending, specific sending countries, but are increasingly or increasingly, increasingly seek regional and continental sustainable development. 
my work on the diasporic black connection also support the center's goal, you know, concerning strengthening solidarity among blacks in Canada and the diaspora that Lance, for instance, has mentioned. I also conduct research with the Sudanese in Canada and in other countries in Sudan and other countries where they are relatively large uh, Sudanese communities, uh, such as Ethiopia and France. And this work encompasses issues of Islam and the struggle against Islamophobia. The connection between blackness, black studies and Islam, and Islamic studies deserve more attention uh, because as you know, there are many blacks, uh, black Muslims or Muslim blacks, again in Canada and uh, the diaspora. And uh, this work on Islam and blacks also allows the center to be more inclusive and the, as the center will also you know, help expand, expand it. So I will wrap up for now. Thank you on this section. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Amal. Thank you so much. And thanks for your leadership and thanks for joining in. And we're going to jump right into it. Please remember, audience, that you can, if you have any questions, please place them in the question and answer section. I see there's participation there, not any questions, but people are giving their accolades and they're sharing and they're pouring love. And that is so important. We're good for time and we're going to go right into our second question, our second round. I, I was very excited when Dr. and Professor George Day started and shared those five things which I wrote them down. I, I love number four, a way to challenge a colonial code. I, I'm definitely, I, put that, I, I want to learn more about that and talk about African spirituality and healing and, and that we don't take a back seat to this kind of work. So as we get into our second round of conversation, starting again with Professor George Day, we're gonna ask the question, we're centering the question this time, how or what do you see as possibilities for your students, academic, and now we're bringing in students, academic and community work with the Center for Black Studies. Many of you have already shared some of that, but there's more we want to hear about the actual work with students, academic and community work within the center. So we're going to start with you again, Professor, and I'm going to be writing my notes again as usual. Thank you so much. <laughs> Professor, yeah, so George, well, over you. to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, um, I, 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 get, I, I just want to highlight five, um, inter, what I call intertwining uh, possibilities. Uh, for both faculty and students uh, in terms of uh, engagements, intellectual and political. Uh, the, the first is about, it's so important for us to document, interrogate and improve the conditions of our students. I'm here talking about our, our black students. There's so much anti-black racism and anti-blackness within our institution, right? Uh, that so there's a whole silencing around that. And I think it's very, very important for us to document that. So work that documents that the black necropolitics actually, actually maybe it talks about, right? For us to document that because that documentation itself becomes a resource of healing and learning from how people have survived some of these challenges. So it's very, very important. And, and I think if we recognize that black studies veers from other disciplines, primarily because of its activism, right? then this is the reason why we have to create this center as a whole, as what Amal was saying, as a whole for collective organizing and solidarity building. And so that, that's the second, um, and, and, and I think Joku alluded to this also, right? As a question of what does it mean to talk about black studies before 1492, right? The world did not begin with 1492. And so the whole question of African indigeneity so, and this is why I'm working with students who are dealing with that question, right? How do we talk about black studies prior to that? And there's a reason why that is important because it allows us to see the categories of blacknesses, right? And the conjoining of Africanness and blackness. It allows us to see that uh, because uh, not only does in the whole discussion of African indigeneity challenge the colonial appellation of indigenous, right? But it also allows us to see how Blackness, right, was conceptualized differently from the Euro construction of blackness, right? And I think it's very, very important. Um, somebody was asking about the, the clothes the others were wearing. 
uh, blackness was about joy, was about pride, was about resistance. It wasn't about this, uh, uh, um, the, the, the criminalization that has been associated with that. It's a very important question. And I think to me, that means that we begin to restore our own lives, right? The whole power of restoring our own lives becomes very, very important in, 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 in that regard for us to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm not done. I think I think okay, I, go I, I, go I, got, I got I got cut off from it. Yes, um, no problem. Go ahead. Yeah. The, the third, right? I said I was going to mention five. The third is um, the space for us to re theorize, and people like uh, Harris and Baird write about it the black and indigenous relationalities. To see black blackness and indigenous in radical relationality, right? And this to me, I, the way I take it is, how we see it as critical friendship. So we are very, very critical of each other, right? But also maintain the gaze where it needs to be maintained, which is around white supremacist logics, which always tries to divide and create this dynamic, this manufactured crisis, right? Between black, black bodies and indigenous bodies. So I think how, what that actually looks at this radical relationalities as a way to build critical friendship and yet still keep the gaze on white supremacy and white uh, supremacist logic. And the fourth is, yes, um, you know, we talk about these centers and we see them as intellectual, but they also have to be social, right? So how do we bring social as part of the discussion of the intellectual? Which is to say that we can't talk about how our students are dealing with all these violences within our institutions and not find a way to heal and fi find a way to make them whole, which is about the social aspect of our work. So that social aspect is what I alluded to earlier, which is bringing in the question of the, the healing, the spiritual, it's very, very important uh, in, 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 in that regard, right? It's very, very important. For it. So it's not just talking about the academic space, but it's also talking about how we use this space to be able to heal and create communities. And lastly, um, and this is the work that I'm currently doing, it's around the question of elders and eldership, right? Uh, so how do we bring, for example, eldership and elders knowledge into the school system. That's one aspect of it. Because African elders provide a sort of wisdom and knowledge base, which is around the question of building communities, relationality, reciprocities, right? Uh, 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 elder stories are metaphors of resistance. And so how do we bring that? But not only do we bring that into the school system, but also how do we create schooling outside the conventional school system using elders knowledge? So using elders knowledge to carve out effective strategies for learning, for teaching, for education, which is outside the current dominant and conventional ways of schooling in that. And that, that's, I see the possibilities that uh, this space allows us to do. Now I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Busy taking my notes. I love, I really love, Professor George Day, I really love you bringing in that, that social, aspect of it as we preserve each uh, uh, make a space so we can we can we can find that joy and that that refuge and that self-preservation and all of that those things and today i was just today in conversation with tdsb um center for black excellence one of the leaders there and, and they talk about the power and the importance and the value of the of elders in the in, in in this work so this is the second time for today this conversation about elders is coming up and so i've taken very very special note to that we're going to ask at this time to join in the conversation professor Roslyn, go ahead please thanks i'm really happy that we're all um like both bringing a lot of um diversity to the conversation in terms of ideas and perspectives while also um on the same page in a lot of ways and so I too um, am thinking about uh, the center uh, in relation to our work and our students work, first of all, as like a site for um, student organizing and particularly autonomous student organizing, um, thinking about uh, even the National Black Graduate Network, uh, which is run by and for grad students um, and connects Black students and all students of Black studies across the country. Um, 
and OISE has supported this project from its inception. Um, and OISE graduate students, um, Sherry Daniel and Marcus Singleton, have served as its first two coordinators. So Marcus is the coordinator now. And it seems to me that the center would be um, a really um, ideal place to also think about um, an MBA, uh, MBGN office. So um, to kind of uh, make a, a, a space for long-term involvement of OISE students um, in the MBGN, not um, as the office, the, you know, the, the coordinatorship and the directorship will change over time and maybe based at a university, but to have an office where um, is kind of a site for national connecting um, among Black students and students of Black studies. And because it's Black student run, it would give them a certain amount of autonomy to do that work. Um, and, and also involve more, more students at Boise. So that's one thing I've been thinking about. And then I've also been thinking in terms of the um, kind of political economic context, again, that we kind of work in and live in and are um, establishing the center in. Um, I would, I think it's a really huge priority that um, we make sure that we don't allow for this moment to expand uh, the social and economic distances um, between and within um, Black and Indigenous communities. And so I think that a primary um, role for the center will be in kind of uh, remaining tethered to um, the communities with which we identify, um, providing a meeting space for projects, developing anti-colonial and anti-capitalist solidarities, um, hosting study groups, um, thinking a lot about um, community research par partnerships and the ways that um, there might be some kind of programs that support community-based, like not just um, us, we and our students doing research, but also community members who wish to do research um, to access uh, the center and to um, form relationships, mutually um, supportive and educative relationships with students and scholars. Um, I really appreciate uh, Dr. Madibo's um, emphasis on the Francophonie and the opportunity for communication and networking across French and English um, speaking uh, Black diasporic communities, and particularly I'm thinking about academic communities and other centers for Black studies, um, not only in Canada, but also across the world. So I just think um, you're such a wonderful um, initial director in that regard. Amal, you have that um, knowledge um, right at your fingertips and that, and that language as well to pursue that. Um, I think also about the ways that my research into Black studies in Canada has been impeded in some ways or slowed in some ways by um, a lot of the things that Dr. Wan talked about um, in terms of archiving and how we record the presence and contributions and work of um, Black scholars over time. And so I'm thinking also about the ways that the center might um, work with the library at OISE to develop and share access um, to Black historical collections, um, to create a repository of theses and dissertations in Black studies. And this is, again, an idea that Jogi was pursuing um, with her graduate research assistants that I think could be further realized and, and made available for research at the center. And finally, in that regard, I also think about research reports and position papers and the ways in which there's such a desire for those kinds of reports um, that kind of connect to issues in the community and events that are happening and how the center could really be a site from which um, graduate student researchers, as well as um, students and, and other scholars of Black studies could, could be writing those kinds of reports and pursuing that kind of work. Um, I think the last thing uh, I wanna kind of return to in, in thinking about the center and, and how it might support um, the work of, of, of my own work and, and the students that I work with, thinking about, um, critical creative praxis again and thinking about theorizing um, with and through art and, and creative practices. Um, and that's work that 
um, has kind of threaded through my life um, as a community worker, as an educator, as an activist, and continues to be part of my um, research, publishing, and teaching. And so many of the students that we work with, um, many Black and Black Indigenous students at OISI included, are artists and art educators and really interested in pursuing arts-informed research. So I think my last hope for the center is also that it will be able to support creative work in various ways. Um, some of those might be hosting small artist workshops, um, providing resources and space for um, experimenting with critical creative ways of, of doing Black Studies research. Um, it could involve um, hosting um, residencies, uh, scholars coming to kind of uh, work with the center um, to promote this kind of work. It's a really generative uh, aspect of Black Studies and contemporary Black Studies research. Um, and then also maybe um, some kind of form of display for students' work. So, um, you know, exhibition space um, can be very modest uh, and also um, opportunities, though, on a kind of rotating basis for students to organize their work for an exhibition and, and to be able to display it um, for the OISI community, I think would be really great. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll close there and just say that I think of the center as, as, as I think of Black Studies, uh, which is both a physical and intellectual space, um, a space where we can convene, where we can study together as students, teachers, comrades, um, and, and, you know, move together in shared projects of anti-colonial and anti-capitalist scholarship, um, visioning resistance as, as Professor Day also called attention to. And of course, um, as Dr. Whitney said, you know, mutual care. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The, the power in the seeds and the suggestions, it's, it's really exciting. You could see it in the comment box in the Q&A, which is supposed to be the Q&A, but of course people are praising their comments the excitement they're feeling. Thank you so much, Professor Roslyn, for sharing all of that and those ideas with us. Professor Lance McCready, over to you, please. Thank you again, sort of really grateful to be in conversation with my colleagues and sort of um, will continue to be sort of lifted and um, inspired by all of their work. And I, I just want to, I guess, talk a little bit about myself, a little bit about why, you know, a Black Studies program in African American Studies was important for me when I was just beginning as an undergraduate student. And, you know, I often got the message uh, coming into sort of my undergraduate study that somehow I had to subtract um, or I had to sort of let go of my interest in sort of Black liberation, about doing, giving back to my communities, and that somehow that was too narrow a focus, and that somehow was meaning that I was sort of shutting down or narrowing even my sort of um, academic and scholarly uh, development. And, you know, uh, incidentally, I got that message here at OISI too when I first arrived when people thought that sort of uh, applying for a social sciences and humanities research council grant to focus and look at the experiences of black boys in school. Um, they thought that that was too narrow or wonder if something like that would ever get funded, right, and so thought that I should be pursuing a more sort of obviously universal or inclusive um, uh, uh, research program. And I think that's actually animated you know, that's not something that uh, Dr. Garrett Walker and I have talked about yet, but, you know, this whole question in, in policy around these universal policies versus um, these targeted policies and what's best that contributes to the um, overall sort of growth and well-being of society. And I've, you know, uh, taken the sort of the position that I think it's really important, especially in terms of uh, Black liberation to have those targeted um, programs and policies that sort of focus on sort of Black communities. And I really wanted to make space for here um, at Boise, and I hope to extend that through the Center for Black Studies and Education for students that want to do that as well. 
you should not have to sort of give up or um, necessarily um, leave behind to your sort of interest in, for instance, sort of Black student achievement or sort of Black women leaders or anything, African diasporic sort of community development. You know, you don't have to leave that behind. And it's not somehow a narrowing of your sort of intellectual growth and development. You can take all of these tools that you're learning here and put it and channel it towards that. And, you know, I have really wanted to sort of make a space for my graduate students and for those colleagues who want to come along with me too um, for that. I just want to mention some of them, you know, Anthony Briggs, Emmanuel Tabby, Yasmin Lalani. Tanitia Monroe, Sosin Igbu, Olivia Aiello, David Pereira, Miguel Angus, Paula Davis, Audrey Littlejohn, Thelma Akiea. These are, and these are not all black students. <laughs> I feel like I'm just gonna put it on the table um, for y'all to sort of, sort of look at and for us to think about. I don't think you have to be black to be engaged in the project of sort of black liberation or black community development. And arguably black liberation and black community development contributes and is a part of the overall development or if you don't like the, the word development, the liberation of society sort of period. And so I think it's important for us to shift that. And I'm so glad that we have a Center for Black Studies and Education that really is symbolically, you know, shows our students, our graduate students and other faculty members, we are here to stay. We are engaged in this larger sort of project of decolonizing education, Black liberation, and that we cannot be moved in that way. And this is now that this is legit. It's always been legit but it's important for us to have sort of symbolically and institutionally a space within Boise. So, so I don't want any student to feel like that ever again, you know, that they somehow have to sort of leave behind their sort of interest and in looking at sort of black student achievement or focusing on sort of black community concerns and that that's not a uh, non-intellectual pursuit. That's very much a scholarly and intellectual pursuit. And I, and I also just, I just wanted to say specifically, I want to sort of bring up sort of three points that I know in the, the Making Spaces Lab and just overall in my work as a, a program director that I'm always sort of wanting to acknowledge and sort of bring in and have us look at, some of which has uh, uh, been mentioned before. One, an idea that Black education uh, is always sort of a lifelong learning pursuit. It involves formal schooling. It would involve sort of our sort of uh, community sort of organizations and learning in those. And it involves all the informal learning that we're doing sort of with our family, amongst our peers, our friends, our parents, you know, our elders. You know, this is so important. So we are bringing to you sort of a, a framework for Black education that involves the formal, the non-formal and informal. We're bringing together that adult education lens, that lifelong learning lens and that Black education lens. The second a sort of sort of piece that I, I want to bring to us is the idea of doing community based research, <laughs> sort of the sort of research that's really grounded. And for me, that means grounded it and involving our um, community members who work in black community organizations. I myself have focused a lot of my work um, with the Black Coalition for AIDS Prevention, which is one of the oldest and the largest sort of um, what they call ASOs, aid service organizations for Black communities in Canada. It is amazing sort of place. There's so much work. There have been so many community members that have dedicated their lives that have prevented so many people from dying of HIV and AIDS that have provided community that have also contributed to this larger agenda of sort of Black health. Right, and we'll continue to do that. So it's really important that and when we're doing that work also that we engage our community members, we engage the folks working in these programs, we engage these directors, facilitators, and program directors as equals, not as someone that's always going in to teach, but someone is who's going in to sort of build uh, capacity. Oh, that is um, wants to contribute to the overall strength of that sort of organization and that sort of gets to sort of my final sort of principle that I want to bring is that is one of truly sort of collaboration and sort of collaboration as equal as us all being in circle. That's why I'm so drawn to sort of restorative approaches for us sort of being able to listen to one another to sort of meet um, as equals and not necessarily to always to create these uh, hierarchies for us to sort of lend sort of the privileges and the resources we have sort of in collaboration to this larger sort of um, agenda for me of Black community 
uh, development. So it's really important that sort of we bring this lifelong learning lens, this community-based research lens, and this um, spirit in the work of collaboration to the Center for Black Studies and Education. Thank you so much for that, Professor Lance McCready. You know, I'm glad and I'm thank you so much and um, Roslyn did that in the first round. Ros when Roslyn, Professor Roslyn spoke, you shared some of your, your positionality, your story, yourself. And it, it's important because I'm telling you this from, from experience and from evidence. There are people listening to us tonight in community and they are moved, they are encouraged. I'm getting texts, I'm getting comments. You see there because the, some of the things that you are sharing and what the community is seeing is not they're, not, they're not just seeing professors that they admire and respect a lot, but they are seeing professors that they are realizing, wow, there's a deeper connection. I'm hearing spirituality. I'm hearing more about community. I'm hearing the story because Lance, you, you really touched me again. This is, this is it's very special because when you share that story, I want to let you know that was my story right here at Boise as well. And I've had more than three other persons said to me, that's their story. The idea of narrowing, of, of what we want to do seems somewhat of narrowing intellectual growth. And so that is something we have to really disrupt. And Joki talked about the, the, the going to the edges and putting those things. Professor George, they talk about the colonial, colonial codes. These are the ways academia has done hurt and harm to black scholars and black students and black studies. And we have to, like you said, Professor George, you're number three, hold institutions accountable. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you for talking so powerful about community. Thank you. And I want to say to everybody who's asking questions, I, I hope you realize that some of the questions you're asking in the box, even now, our panelists are addressing them because you address that hierarchical, hierarchical question extremely uh, directly just now, Professor Lance McCready. So thank you so much for that. We're going to move right along. I'm so inspired. I'm so inspired this evening. I'm a part of the panel. I'm the moderator. And I'm drawing so much inspiration. I can just imagine, you know, everybody else. So thank you so much. J Professor Joki, jump right in, please. Jump right in there. All the seeds being planted. I know when it comes to seeds, you are a planter. Go ahead and share with us, please. <laughs> Thank you, ABC. Um, again, I don't want to duplicate what the others have said, but I see our work as complementary. We are coming from different angles, different directions. And when there is that complementality, it means there will be no lack of resources in terms of the intellectual growth. That's number one. I see us as um, having a unit, a, a unity of purpose. That is the purpose for us to bring everything pertaining to people of African ancestry, to black folks, you know, to, to place it on the center. The other thing is, you know, talking about uh, student research, students, Honestly, they are so smart, the students we have. And sometimes they get constrained in terms of what they can do within an academic space. We, at least now I know that in the last, I think one year and a half, we have a professor within U of T who is, who is there to teach dance, to interpret dance, to interpret what it means to be an artist, the spoken word. The center will be that space that will be providing, you know, space for students who want to come and their dissertation is their, their spoken word. Their dissertation is the movement of the dance because as black people danced, they did not dance for the purposes of dancing. There was a reason why they danced. When the black people drummed, they were not just drum, drumming so that people could move their bodies, they were drumming with the passing of messages. So I see all this complementality, all this work that will be um, done under the, the, the center, uh, under the umbrella of the center, will sort of be the connective tissue to the community. And I'll pause there to say, I remember when I started work at OISE, the, 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 the black community, 
and the indigenous community held my hand. And I'll say this in terms of Zenena Kande. She opened our home where we could meet as a black community to discuss the issues that were taking place at OISE and to strategize. I want to say thank you to her. Now we do have a community of intellectuals that we can do that, but we should not forget that the, some of the seeds of what we do came from the community. The other thing I would like to say at the beginning when it was only George and I, every year, George will organize a market. Once during summertime, we'll, be, we'll have a market day where the community will come, where we'll be, there'll, be, there'll be produce, there'll be all kinds of things on the second floor of Oise. I want to see that opening spaces, having a whole two days. I remember it was during, we'll do it as a weekend. And the, the people from the community will come. They'll be dancing, they'll be sharing, they'll be, we, we will learn so much. And I found by doing that, bringing in the community to OISE, there was a lot of correction of miseducation. There was a lot of correction of miseducation. In addition to that, if I can say that, as I was connecting with the black communities in, in, um, in, in Canada, I was directed to the communities at Owen Sound. There used to be a black community in Owen Sound. Windsor, I traveled to Windsor. I traveled to Halifax to, to connect with the black communities there. And they'll tell me stories. They'll tell me stories of how it used to be because I met people who were in their eighties and the nineties at that, at that particular time. So for me, the students and the center we want to ensure that nothing is left without full explanation. Like today we had a, a, a libation. I know there are a lot of people who are asking, what does libation mean? What does it represent? The center will be that place where we'll have lessons on how and why and who can do the libation. And hence what Professor Day was saying, having elders, because you have to be an elder to some respect to do libation. I've taken it upon myself once in a while when I see it's necessary to do it. I also see based on the unit, uh, unity of purpose to plan now that we are growing as black uh, faculty succession. In uh, another five years, the faces of the black faculty will change. What, what is the, what is our succession plan. The last but not least, it was start a little bit healing. We need to heal. And the expertise of healing are not within the academy. They are out there in the community. We need to liaison with the members of the community for us to start healing. And no one, as I said, when I was doing my opening uh, speech, no one will do it for us. We have to do our own healing. No one can do it for us. And Lida talked you know, about the mental health. No one can help us. We need to have those conversations. We need to have those conversations with, with the expertise, the psychologists, the black psychologists, and then members of the community. What are we healing from? What is causing us mental breakdown? We need to go to the root cause of that. Last but not least, in terms of uh, relationality, I do remember before Columbus, Blacks used to sail across the Atlantic Ocean and the indigenous communities of the Americas will open arms to them. We need to strengthen that relationship that was there thousands and thousands of years because we cannot allow the colonial logic to disrupt and to create conflict and to create division among us. Our ancestors established it and we need to honor it. If we don't honor it, we will be to some extent dishonoring them because there is this notion of hierarchy, hierarchy as to who is closer to whiteness. We need to, to dismantle that that hierarchy that has been created by colonization. 
Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much again. I know I've said this before, and I've said this a couple of times this evening, but I see the comment in the box. I know what I'm feeling. I see the thing. I see the reaction. It's a powerful evening of grounding and, and, and hope and building, you know, and speaking into people's lives. You know, if I was ever tired of the work that I'm doing tonight, I am re-energized. I am I feel like I've been fueled. As we talk about pouring the, walk, the, the oil and the wine, I genuinely feel that the oil and the wine has been poured in from Professor George Day, Professor Joe Kiwan, Professor Lance McCready, from Professor Rosin Hamilton, Professor Linda, Professor um, Amal, Professor, all of us, Professor um, 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 Whitney. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for doing that. The seed planting, it's clear. And I just want to remind everyone that there's a copy of this video this evening's recording will be sent to everyone because I know, like me, you are trying to take enough notes and you know you can't because you want to engage. So the recording will be available. Professor Whitney, please join us in conversation as we talk mm -hmm. more about the future and the hope and the possibilities. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. ABC. Dr. Jokey Wan, can you come back on camera, please? Please, yeah. I need to see your face. Can yeah. we see your face, Mama? Can we see your face? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, when you have notes and then you get moved and then you have to trash your notes. So, Octavia Butler, Octavia Butler, Ibaye, um, was a, a, a Black queer woman, scholar, prophet, if you will, wrote many books in the um, field she created. <laughs> Afrofuturism, right? She talks about seeds. Dr. ABC just said, you know, uh, mentioned C, uh, Dr. Juan laying seeds, planting seeds. Um, and I wanna say thank you to you. When I think about black feminism, black feminist thought, that black feminist standpoint theory um, in Canada, uh, <laughs> Dr. Jokey Juan, and Dr. Notisha Masakwa wrote a seminal text about Black feminism in Canada, what that means for Black women in Canada. And I want to say thank you for that seed. And we need a second edition, okay? And we, we're, we're, re we're ready, we're waiting for that. These seeds are important, y'all. These are not just seeds of liberation. Liberation is not something that is hard. It's not something that your heart is hardened by. Liberation is joy. It is lived experience. It is patient. It's kindness. It's critical, right? Thinking about how all these systems and structures of oppression continue to impact Black people, right? Black feminism is one of the ways that I, as a Black feminist scholar, um, in the tradition that Dr. Joki Wan has laid for me, right? And so um, I just have to say that to you publicly, Jokey. I have to say that to you publicly. This is about love. Yes, we are on a time schedule. And guess what? <laughs> and did. <laughs> okay. So um, I'd also like to take a page out of Dr. Lance McCready's book. Um, I, too, um, grew up in the States. Um, particularly, I am born and raised in California. And I went to UC Berkeley as an undergraduate. That was the first time in my entire life, I won't tell you how old I am because it ain't your business, okay? But that was my first time being surrounded by Blackness with the Black Recruitment and Retention Center, um, joining Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated Kappa Chapter, right? Like these are my first opportunities in saying, wow, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one, right? Um, and then, I be, decide to become a teacher. I never learned anything about Blackness in teaching children who were Black as a Black person, never. When I was studying to become a school administrator, never, not once did I learn about how the experiences of Black, of a Black, Indigenous, and queer woman, how I would be perceived differently, how I, how I could say one thing, right, in a meeting, and someone else who doesn't look like me or is positioned the way that I am in the world could say the exact same thing I said and then get more kudos than me. 
policy get passed without, right? And so being Black is more than just um, experiencing, you know, this epithelial environment. It is in everything in our culture, um, in music, in food, in literature, we are everything, right? And so when I think about what I want to see as an educator, as a scholar practitioner in this center, I want folks in teacher education to see themselves reflected in this center, to learn what it means to see Black children as humane, as human instead of as terrors, right? Um, as capable of learning instead of, um, oh, you, you speak differently, you must need an individualized education plan, right? Like I want, I want that to be the case. I want teachers, I want scholars, I want leaders, I want us all to come together, like I said earlier, for the sake of solidarity, love, and critical hope. So critical hope is not just, you know, Dr. Jeff Andrade, um, noted comrade, school administrator, um, awesome human from the Bay, professor at SF State, theorized around the same time that President Obama became president in the United States about this idea regarding critical hope. And I'll shorten it. Critical hope is not this wishing, right? My grandmother, Virginia, um, she is living and she would say, faith without works is dead. She, she says that, I grew up with that notion, right? And so critical hope is just that. And I write about this in my work. Critical hope is love. It is the ability to um, see beyond the four walls of the school building of any physical space, as Dr. Rosalind Hampton mentioned, and into what can be because the past, present, and future lives within us, right? And so how are we preparing school leaders, teachers, staff, district officials in the field of education to support Black children in this way, to support Indigenous children in this way? How are we doing that? And I believe that this center in Oise, which is so groundbreaking and remarkable, I have chills and I'm not even cold, right? It is going to be a hub for this. It is going to be a space where we can have, you know, meaningful collaboration and conversation as many of my colleagues mentioned. And so, you know, the last point, the last two points I wanna bring up is this notion of healing, which is also central to my research. Healing is ongoing for Black people. We don't just, oh, I, I meditated today, I am healed, on to the next. That's not how healing works, y'all. Similar to, I won't ruin this book, but Octavia Butler wrote a book called Wild Sea, my favorite book. So much so that I named uh, the metaphor, replanting a wild seed, as the title of my dissertation. And she writes about this character named Anyawu who has the power to shape shift into, you know, inanimate objects, uh, animals, whatever you name it. And she also has the power to heal self, minor cut, whatever, um, and to heal others. And I liken Black people to Anyawu. We know how to heal. We know what it takes. And I believe that the healing in Oise, because we know that there's some healing that needs to take place, and the healing in Toronto, the healing in the GTA, the healing in Ontario is going to start and end with us in solidarity with indigenous peoples and those who are non-Black willing to be part of this uh, part of this journey. And so at the end of the day, it is a space for healing that's necessary. It's a space for collective research and also professional development. There's no need for consulting when you have scholars like us who are ready and willing to serve. Hello, somebody. Yes. So keeping keeping that in mind, go to the source. This center is the source. Thank you. You take me to the black church all the time. Why Can I get an that? amen? <laughs> Powerful. Wow. Amen. Yes. yes, yes. Dr. Linda, jump right in, please. Please jump right in. Oh my gosh, I'm so moved and inspired by all these powerful words. Uh, thank you to all of you. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna, you know, cut right to it. I mean, we've been having a conversation around healing and wellness, um, you know, that Dr. Day sort of introduced into this conversation. 
and central to what I do, um, you know, and, and why I became a psychologist is the idea of healing. And I really hope that, you know, through the center, we really can bring healing and use that space for that in a really tangible way. Um, you know, as Dr. Wan mentioned, our communities are a source to go to for information about how to heal. We, we have it in us. Um, but we can also bring in our expertise, right? Um, you know, and, and in the field of clinical psychology and at OISE, we have many, we have students who are training and working in this area. And so if we can kind of capitalize on those and leverage that knowledge and th that, that expertise, we can actually have, you know, create opportunities for students to support each other. You know, when we have these incidences that do occur still where there's, you know, um, violence against our students, racial, uh, race-based violence that, that, that happens. Often, you know, we're scrambling for how do we support our students? What do we do, you know? Um, so I'm hoping and envisioning that the center can be a place where people can turn to for, for, uh, for support, for, you know, for scholarship, for, you know, a, as a space really where people can kind of come for a point of reference for how to deal with these incidences and situations when they do occur. And, and a big thing for me, um, I'll just add is mentorship. You know, I, it's so huge, you know, coming in, um, I know that part of the reason why I'm even here is because of the advocacy and the hard work of the Black Faculty um, Caucus at OISE and, and many of the, the elders before me really pushing for, for us to have, bring that expertise in, in, in psychology and especially clinical psychology to, to OISE. And so I really want to support, you know, mentorship for students um, to support the community of, of graduate students who are training to become licensed practitioners um, so that they have a place to go where they can find community in one another, um, find peer support you know, established cohorts of students of African ancestry who are enrolled in these psychology programs um, and really bring visibility um, to our field and, you know, and engaging them with some of the work that's being done. We're really excited right now. There's a new CP, um, the, the Association for Psychologists in Canada has a new section on black psychology, which is something that's completely almost radical. Um, so really excited. There's a lot of traction in the field and I'm just excited for this center to be a, a, a space that we can really leverage some of that expertise and the skills and the students and also have it to be a place where we can really support um, the healing work. Uh, that's that we need to do in our community. So I'll, I'll step in there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lind, Professor Linda. Professor Amal, join us again back in conversation with all this seed planting and these the, the, the level of conversation we're happening about hopefulness. Join us in conversation, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I am very empowered. And but also being the last speaker, most of what I wanted to share has been iterated, uh, which is fine because it reminds me on us that, you know, we have, we each have our specific focus, but um, we also have common goals. You know, so it is all good, but so I can say that. Yeah, so my, my grandmother taught me that the sky is not the limit. And this notion of the sky is not the limit, my, my grandmother did not appropriate it. Actually the opposite of is true. And she said uh, that is because there are no limits, because believing is powerful. And um, when I was a student at OISI in what is now the Department of Social Justice Education, where I am now, you know, um, happily a, a professor. So when I was a student, uh, there was no mention of a black center, black studies center. Although, of course, we know that, you know, the idea of a black space, you know, and um, the inclusion and activism role that black spaces play has always, has always been there. But the idea of a black studies center didn't um, crystallize when I was a student and uh, Professor Wen said that, you know, they convened the meeting, their first meeting back in 2019. I, had, I left OISE in 2006. And Linda said that there are two black professors in her program. 
actually, when I was a student at OISE, they were two black professors at OISE. Uh, our um, uh, the pioneers and leaders and educators, Georgie Day and Joki, Joki Wen. So now, obviously, you know, there is a center, an actual center, and we are a community now of educators, and our numbers and work will only grow, will only continue to, to grow. Which tells me that, tells that together we can accomplish so much. As uh, the new director of the center, I see a world of possibilities. Obviously, you know, through, you know, the um, collective and mutual uh, empowerment of of and within our, our community. Uh, regarding students, of course, the issue of mentorship, mentorship of black students is a priority. And again, when I was a student, you know, I was one you know, at OZ, I was mentored, uh, so lucky and fortunate, you know, I was to be mentored by um, my uh, black uh, educators. And it was a very empowering experience, which helped me so much, you know, to navigate the predominantly white uh, university and uh, to find a place for myself and also then, you know, for my community, including the students. Uh, speaking about that community, and, uh, you know, we know that the university and the community are not disconnected. Uh, they are very much uh, connected and mutually, again, enriching and empowering. Uh, Dr. Day, you know, um, reminded us of the elders and how to um, include them in the center, which is a very important issue. And, uh, you know, overall, the intergenerational uh, dialogue is very, is very important, uh, which uh, also means that uh, the center is important for the center and it will do, we will do that to also focus on black youth, you know, programs and workshops, you know, to empower black youth that, you know, would be, you know, one um, of the, some of the work that the center will do in partnership with, uh, with the community. For example, you know, Dr. Hampton uh, mentioned, made an excellent suggestion of, you know, the, for the center to host exhibits by students uh, that can also be extended to the community at large, you know, so that also artwork by the larger community would also be displayed in, uh, in the center. And um, of course, engagement also with the schools is very important, um, you know, including with the Francophone school system and higher education. Uh, you also mentioned you know, the important issue of documenting knowledge and continuing to document black knowledge and also claiming black knowledge. Lance mentioned that uh, Du Bois um, is not getting, has not gotten to date, to date the recognition that he deserves as a founder of sociology. And not only in the Canada, by, in Canada, by the way, it is, you know, in sociology over, overall. Uh, when, when I taught sociology at the University of Calgary, uh, I also taught uh, black, uh, black sociology and of course meant uh, to center Du Bois as a founder, as a founder of sociology. And yeah, so overall, without repeating what my colleagues have said, uh, there are some possibilities and stay tuned to benefit and enjoy all of that. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have now come to the end of our conversation, I'm going to ask that, um, Neil, if you could maybe center everyone um, um, on, the, on camera for us. I want to say thank you to Professor George Day, Professor Rosalind, Professor Lance, Jokey, Whitney, Linda, and of course, our new um, founding director, Professor Amal. I also want to say thanks 
to the profess three professors who were with us in, 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 in the past, not able to join us this year, Professor Ann Lopez, Professor Fickley in CTN, and Professor Wanja. Uh, so those voices were amazing. Thanks again to the Dean who have been here with us for the entire um, presentation, for the entire conversation, I should say. Um, I'm gonna use the words that I saw maybe more than four persons have used in the chat. I am full. I am full. Thank you so much. I am full. You know, I am one of those persons who's always out there doing, doing, sitting down and listening to all of you and just taking all of this. I am full. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're going to close right now. But the last voice for a minute, just to say thank you, is our leader. We must recognize our leader of the chair, the chair of the equity committee, Professor Emmanuel. Professor Emmanuel, please, last words, the wrap up and the vote of thanks. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure serving you. See you next year, same place, same time, when we continue our conversation. And we continue our conversation. Professor Emmanuel, over to you for the thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for your amazing uh, moderation. And uh, tonight, I would really like to thank all those who contributed to the success of this event. So first, the Dean's Office, who has doubled their efforts to make this event happen, and particularly Dean Normand Labry. Uh, I would also like to thank Education Commons and the OEC Communications team who have worked hard behind the scene. Um, then, of course, the Social Justice Department and all its members, especially those who joined the panel today. And to each, thank you for your commitment. Um, then all of you who joined us, and uh, we had 550 registered today at noon, which is a record, a record really, congratulations. And finally, my colleagues on the equity committee without whom uh, this event would not have been possible, and particularly May Naji, Helen Wong, Andrew B. Campbell, Jennifer Tucker, and all others. So to all of you, a huge thanks and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.